Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We're going to show some major love to the rhythm section. And uh, my guest today is the one and only wonderful Lenny Castro. He's my first percussionist, so Lenny is breaking my cherry. Be gentle, okay? Um, and uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Doug Bossy. Thanks for hooking me and Lenny up. Lenny is one of the most recorded percussionists in pop history. He's originally from New York City, son of a musician, Hector Castro, who is a pianist and musical director for Johnny Pacheco and Celia Cruz, as well as having his own group, Conjunto Candela, his first cut, that was good, right? For a white dude to say it like that, right? That um, excellent. <laughs> I, got, I got a tear in my eye. <laughs> his first conga and drum set was given to him by his stepfather, George Cordero. Uh, Lenny went to the same high school his dad attended, which of course was High School of Music and Art. He also mm -hmm. attended Manus College of Mu Music, Third Street Music School, the All Borough Band and Orchestra all high school band and orchestra, as well as playing in salsa bands like Johnny Colon and Eddie Palmieri and other local New York bands at the age of 14. Mm. At age 19, he was working in Frank Ippolito's pro drum shop and was discovered by Melissa Manchester. Shortly after that, Melissa and the band moved to L.A. and, where he, where, and Lenny followed, and he met musicians there like Steve Lukather, David Garfield, Carlos Vega, as well as the Porcaro family, Chuck Delmonico, and loads of others. He soon became a part of the L.A. scene and began working steadily for producers there of course he's a member of toto now as as the percussionist and has been for quite some time lenny's record check out this list this is literally the most impressive list of names i've ever read in one like <laughs> thing this is badass no, don't make me sing all right lenny <laughs> lenny's recorded and, and toured all around the world with the following artists and this is just like a pimple on the elephant's ass melissa manchester rolling stones elton john u2 joe sample toto boz skaggs ricky yeah. lee jones wayne shorter yeah. adele yeah. glenn fry yeah. the eagles dan fogelberg fleetwood yeah. mac stevie nicks george yeah. benson Steve yes, Lukather, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Rufus and Chaka Khan, Brian Culbertson, Eros Ramazzotti, Noel Gallagher, Kid Rock, Maroon 5. Dude, this is like amazing. Dave Koz, <laughs> Michael Buble, Justin Bieber, Justin Timberlake, all the Justins, Dave yes. Sanborn, Amy Grant, Papa Roach, the Wallflowers. Fuck, oh, this yeah. is amazing. Tom Petty, I mean, I, I, Clint Black, oh, Dolly Parton, Dwight Yoakam, Rod Stewart, Al Jarreau, the Rockettes. Bet Midler, okay. this you is like, stop. I mean, no, I want to keep, this is like a Mars Volta. I mean, this is like such a cross section. Peter Chris, Joe Cocker, Joe Bonamassa, Zuccaro. Yeah, Zuccaro. I mean, this yeah. guy's like, he's international and shit. Uh, yeah. He's worked on films like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Hancock, The Fugitive, Nine to Five, Gorillas in the Mist. And he's done tons of commercial top end jingles like Toyota. Burger King, and he's worked on animations like Family Guy, American Dad, The Simpsons, Phineas and Ferb, and most important, throw all of that aside, Lenny is an artist now. He just released his first solo record called Hands of Silk and Sewn. It's a great record, man. I was telling him beforehand I wanted to be careful how I said this because he, I wanted him to know my intentions. I was shocked yeah. because the songs are really well written and the melodies are great, and you don't necessarily... I don't wouldn't necessarily expect that from a drummer. That could be my own ignorance, but man, that's really a great record, and I would love serious everybody to listen to it. It's man. that serious compliment you're throwing at me. Thank you so much. I man, do thank you. It. And thank you for having me on your show, man. Thank you, you man. Do. I appreciate your time. Dude. Are you kidding me? So, uh, man, how? Oh, can I, show me your hands. I got to see your hands. <laughs> I see the Skype. I can't see well, all the. I've been I've been off for about three three months now, so you know they're a little. I haven't been playing that much, but they, you know, they usually, yeah, in about three weeks, they'll get pretty gnarly. <laughs> I would hate to like be your kid and you get pissed off at me and like gotta spank oh, me. Holy! Listen, I, I actually did that one time to my son where he was just acting like a little shit, and I just popped the finger on his butt, whack, <laughs> you know, and it left a welt on him, and and I just, you know, I just never forgave myself for that. Yeah. I never ever did it again. I know because yeah, they're like so powerful. It's funny because when you watch you play, because I I watched a lot of videos of you to, uh, prior to doing this interview, and um, I had never really watched the percussionist up close like that for that long, and it was amazing because it, I'm like, where's the drumsticks? Because it, it, I mean, I couldn't believe how fast your hands move. Oh, thank you. I was like, no, I'm not as fast as some guys, but I, you know, I, I keep up. No, dude, it was great. You kidding me? There's your wife bringing coffee oh, yeah. time. 
She's, oh, she's got my water. That's Tia. Tia, that's, that's great. How you doing, Tia? Nice Hi. to meet you. How are you? She's the one saying on Honey's a Good Girl. You did well there, Tia. She loves it. Oh, thank you. So, uh, man, you were doing gigs at 14. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it was so funny. It was Johnny Colon, mm -hmm. who was, um, he was a trombone player turned keyboard player. There's also Willie Colon. Right. Who was the trombone player, you know. But Johnny was a trombone player originally, and he turned keyboard. And then he actually, and, uh, I I, um, I don't know how I got wind of that audition, but I had to go, I had, he was living in the East River Projects with his mom, and that's where I went to go audition. And it was the funniest thing, though, because I go, I show up, we're in his living room, his mom's in the kitchen cooking, blah, 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 and we're playing. We get a knock on the door, and this guy, you know, the mother opens the door, and this guy walks in. He's all pissed off. So we're still rehearsing. Finally, Johnny goes, okay, okay, that's enough. Stop, stop. And he turns to the guy and says, what do you want? You know, what's going on? What are you here for? He says, no, you you didn't tell me I'm not in the band and this and that. And <laughs> it just so happens it was the conga player who had the gig before I did. Oh, my God. <laughs> all pissed, man. He was all and I'm sitting there going, oh, here we go. The drama's starting on, and they start getting into it. Before you know it, Johnny gets popped in the face. Are you kidding me? Flies across, oh, yeah, flies across the fucking living room, lands in front of my congas, and I just look around and says, okay, I'm out of here. Call me for the first gig. <laughs> yeah. I beelined out of there because I didn't want to get, and his mother comes out with the frying pan and beating the guy on his head, and I packed my shit up. Holy and like, shit. <laughs> so I got the gig. But that was how I got it. And then from that point on, you know, I started doing uh, local gigs, after hours joints, you know, like starting at one in the morning to eight in the morning. They used to have a lot of these after hours places in New York. Private clubs kind of though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they would they would, they would take a, like a dilapidated building or something right. that was, you know, and go into the basement and fix it up and run run a, a, a club there for as long as they could. And then they'd move it around, you know. Yeah, they were after yeah. hours. And uh, they were tough. I mean, those are you were doing. I mean, from from about one in the morning to eight in the morning, you did about four or five sets of heavy wow. hard salsa. And I sometimes I would come home with my hands bloodied. You know, and my mother would think that somebody you know shot me and says, "No, man, I'm, I'm just I made some money." It's, yeah, yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> What's funny is that I just want to tell people listening that drama. Um, that, that Lenny had in the house. And Puerto like, Rico. Yeah, Puerto but, but outside of like New York, people are like, oh my God, that's just like another day. That's like to be expected. That's like, that's what happens. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, you people, know, yeah, that no. was my introduction. And I took it very well, you know, and, and you know, playing with Johnny, like I said, we played after all his places. We played the Corso, the Hippocampo, all the, the clubs that were around. We did the Jazzmobile. I don't know if you remember that. Exactly. There was a... There was a program called the Jazzmobile where they they would pick uh, a neighborhood and take put a band on this flatbed and drive it to the neighborhood, drive it to the block, and set up a stage there, and we'd do concerts. That's pretty cool, actually. I don't ever saw that. Yeah. Well, that's when that's you know really that's cool. when that's when the government cared about the arts. about music. Yeah, yeah. About music. That's when you know the programs. I tell you what, I was in New York at the right time because the programs that they had for music were all over the place. They flourished. You can, you, I mean, it was hard not to uh, be able to go and learn something. There were schools and after school things, and there was a lot of stuff available. Well, it's funny I, when I was reading this uh, all borough band because I played at Bronx Borough Wide. Yeah, That's Borough Wide. Yeah. yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. We did Carnegie Hall, man. So, so I did, did I, man. 16. Did you too? Yeah, it's 76. I, I forget when it was, but I was 16 years old when I did it. You're like a little older than me. So, yeah, I was I was yeah, 76. Yeah. I was like 13, I think. That so, was a scary freaking gig I ever did, man. Did you have to <laughs> sign in? Did you do the – they had this big, like, fucking phone – like, massive thing, like a yeah, phone. I don't remember if I signed in. I probably did. I might – because I played there a, a few times after when I got – when I went professional, I played there with Joe Sample and I played there with Ricky Lee Jones, of all people, at Carnegie <laughs> Hall. <laughs> I mean, it was cool, though. It was all cool. But I don't remember signing that book. It's very possible that I did. Yeah, that was a cool experience. So did you go, like, I remember we, a couple of us stood on stage and, a, and then mm -hmm. we switched and a couple of us way in the back. Yeah. Just to see how the 
the, 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 the acoustics. Yeah. How the acoustics were. Yeah. It's pretty amazing, you know? Oh, yeah. That's an incredible building, you know? And we got the whole thing, you know, our, you know, uh, uh, the last day of rehearsal before we did the uh, the concert, you know, of course, the conductor says, anybody comes up to you and says, you know, and you ask them how to get to Carnegie Hall, you tell them practice. They, they tell you practice. You said, I'm already playing there. That's right, man. Or you got the gig. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What about, what do you think, or maybe she even told you, what what was the thing about you that appealed to Melissa Manchester that she reached out to you and asked you to join? Oh, my God. It's, uh, I guess it was just my, I mean, I, I, there was no I, no attitude. I just wanted to play. I was hungry. Right. And any they asked me, I did. Can you sing? Yes. Can you play this? Yes. Here, let's jam on this. No problem. Were you always just, you're very like uh, charismatic. Were you always like that? Well, I, yeah, I, yeah, I guess. Yeah, well, I get that's, a, a, huge, that's huge, that, man. That, charismatic. Well, you know, personality and, you know, what you bring aside from what you're playing is yeah. very important, and especially in the studio business when it was, a, when there were studios. Right. You know, you brought more to the table than just your playing. You had to deal with producers, uh, writers, engineers, second engineers, and you, you had to treat these people right. Yeah. You know, treat them right. It, it, you know, you're all there for one purpose, was to make great music, you know? And um, as far as producers go, I mean, I, I would go through the ringer for some guys. Yeah. But that was my gig. That was, you know... Yeah, play a cowbell. Play it 50 different ways, and then they tell you, what did you do originally? <laughs> okay, that's what we want. Right, right. That's, that's the game. Yeah. That's, the, that's the gig. You know, and some producers were better than others. Some were... Mm, yeah. Some didn't know their assholes from their elbows, but they that's why they hired, you know, uh, uh, um, hired guns like me to, to, to come in and say, I want percussion. Well, what do you want? I don't know. Right. Uh, so you sit down, you listen to it, get your let your imagination go, and tell them, okay, you want this, 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 this. What do you think? Sounds great. Let's go. But it sounds you know? like you were, you had a really good awareness that you were in the service business from early on. Yes and no. I mean, it was just you know I was brought up right. I had great, wonderful, beautiful parents. I was brought up by people. Uh, my family was lots of love. That's cool, man. My mom and dad showed me, you know, told me you had to teach people, you know, treat people right. Um, just, you know, and, and just growing up in New York, you, you could see everywhere that doing the wrong thing and saying the wrong thing gets you to the wrong place. Yeah. Quick. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, you got to live and learn. So for me to stay in that, in this business, I had to really, cause when I first came out here, I had a serious New York edge that I had to learn how to <laughs> hone down. Cause I, you know, I was like, <clears throat> I'm not letting these West Coast guys get over me. I'm an East Coast guy, you know. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I, I got over that. It's <laughs> funny, know? man. I hold it down, and 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 it was things went much better. So, Lenny, I'm gonna I'm gonna start naming artists. If you could like maybe talk about how you connected with them initially, and huh. you know, there's tons of stories here, but uh, uh, any oh, cool dude. or interesting story that you could think of related to them. All right. So let's Go start ahead. with Toto. Shoot. Go ahead. Oh, Toto. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, I was with those guys since before we were Toto. We were basically all Boscag's uh, backup band. Right. Me, Jeff, Luke, Steve. Um, uh, we were all in that band. And basically, well, the thing was that I got into I got into the Boz thing. It was me and Luke. We were doing a, a Diana Ross Baby It's Me album. And Jeff was on it. And it was the first time I met Jeff. And as soon as our eyes met, it was like, man, I know you. It was a, there was a kismet thing. There was a, we did, we had never met. I really just met his, you know, heard his name and started hearing how great this guy was. And as soon as we met, he was like, man, I know you. We know each other. So after the session, we locked so heavy. He came to me and Luke and said, guys, I got a gig for you. Boz is looking for a percussionist and a guitar player. Show up at this sound stage at this time, okay? Wow. And me and Luke, uh, we're the you know we're the young bucks, and we're like, yeah, okay, cool. I didn't even know who Boz was at the time. Tell you the that's, truth, that's funny. I was just swimming in the waters. I didn't even care where. You must have felt that must have felt great though. Well, you just know, to get got, that invite. Wow, yeah, we got the invite, and me and Luke were nervous as hell. We got there, 
And we thought it was an audition. You know, we played with Boz, we did a few songs. And Boz says, it's great. See you later. And split. So me and me and me and Lukather looked at Jeff and said, what, did we get the gig? Mm. And he laughed. It was like, you had the gig before you got here, guys. Wow. Boz just wanted to see you. So, and from that point on, me and Jeff hooked up heavily because um, Jeff would want me on every session that he that he did. He would call me, he would be at sessions at the studio, call me up and says, come to the studio now. I We need tambourine, we need you, I need you, I need you here. And, you know, he, he did wonders for my career because he was the man. He was the cat yeah. you know, in the music business as far as drums and as far as just knowing how to uh, create a song. You know, he just, he was great at it. And producers, he would say, yeah, my drums are okay. You guys overdub. And the producers would go, great. He said so, it's fine. Right. So me and him got pretty close. We got very, very close. And when they formed the Toto thing, he says, you're coming with me. And so then, you know, I became a part of the Toto thing from the from the giddy up, from note one. You That's know? so cool, man. Yeah, I was very lucky, man, to just land right into that situation. And and uh, him and his brothers and his father, Joe, just took me under their wing. I became a part of the Picaro family and the Lukather family, too. I got to really, well, I became very close with Lukather. Uh, I'm godfather to his first kids. Oh, wow. I knew his dad and his mom before they passed. And oh, wow. We, you know, we, him and I have serious history. We've watched each other grow up and we've helped each other throughout many situations good and bad yeah man and we're we're real you know we're we're very very close him and i so that's basically you know from then on it's just the history from that after that and now 40 years later yeah right <laughs> people are there how did you do africa how did you do africa? Uh, we'll talk about that doug told me to ask you doug <laughs> said make sure you ask lenny about Africa and how something about they didn't want to do the song and you had tape loops wrapped around a mic stand. Oh well, or well, first of all, it, it uh, the well, I'll tell you that later on afterwards. But um, I was these guys were doing stuff in the studio that I had never even knew was possible. You know, they were doing things before the loop was available and before sampling was available, before any of that digital stuff was available. They were doing it backwards cymbals and backwards tambourines, you know. Uh, on Rosanna, there's a tambourine, backwards tambourine that I do, the thumb roll, and they took it and turned it around and zap, you know, and I was like, man, these guys are crazy, man. But they're <laughs> cutting edge stuff. So when it got to Africa, what happened was we rehearsed the song, and then when we got into the studio, Jeff and I, Jeff said, set up right in front of me. And it was just me and him, and so we set up, and we played the groove. And we filled up a whole 24 track reel of that groove. We just played until the reel ran out. Um, just just we the two back, of you? Just me and him, just that groove. Until, okay, and again, it's just because there was no looping at the time. So you had to just play it through the whole thing. Okay. So what happened was after that, they picked up. Now, I'm not sure if it's eight measures or 16 measures, but they cut the tape and found the best eight or 16 measures. Cut it, spliced it together, and then it was such a long loop of tape, we had to use microphone stands as cap stands around the studio. Now, this is Sunset Sound in the control room. It was amazing. you know. So what we did was we played that loop on one machine, and we recorded the loop on another machine and filled up that 24 track of that, of that groove, of the loop. Okay, so you took the 16 bars and then you put it on a 24. Exactly. Okay. Just to because and you couldn't then, expand it any other way. No, there was yeah. no way. Right. I had to take that 24 and put it on that 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 16 bars and put it on another 24. Right. And then take and fill up that tape. Right. And that's the tape that we started building on. Holy shit. And wow. from there, we added, I forget, we added bass, I think we had, well, keyboards, bass, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly the sequence, the exact sequence of it, but that's, that was the foundation, was me and him. That's and, wild, uh, man. Because if you listen to it, you know, the tempo, the time will change, it'll, you know, there's some two fours and three fours and stuff, but the groove keeps on going, but the groove is so cool, it fits anywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> you put anything, you put a turd on that son of a bitch, and it's going to be incredible. That's that amazing. Group was so thick, it was so heavy, you know, and and it just it was very dominant. And so, like I said, from that point on, we just built, uh, oh my god, tons of guitars and tons of percussion and tons. There was like sixteen tracks. People don't know how much there is on that fucking thing. It's it's an epic. Hey, but at least you got your return on your investment back on that one. Even still now, man, yeah. it's it's an entity all in itself, man. It's it's got a life of its own now, and it's really amazing to be a part of something that's become an anthem pretty much globally now. Yeah, that's you really know, cool, man. It, you know, uh, uh, Weezer gave us some big love. You know, doing it. <laughs> they did a very cute version of it. I like it. That's it's it's amazing. it's basic. It's very very basic, but. It does justice to the song, I think. Yeah. That's great, man. Congratulations. Seriously. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed, man. I'm totally lucky. Uh, blessed, lucky, whatever. You know, it was, the, as, as they say, the labor of love, you know. Yeah, and no. you don't really think of it. We were just going. I was going with them. Okay, they're doing this? Fuck them. I'm going to go do it, too. Sure. You know? Sure. And I learned so much from them, from Jeff, from just the way they worked, from David Page, how he wrote from Steve Picaro and his electronics. Still to this day, Steve is still pushing me to learn more electronics. And because of him, I've learned a lot more about synths. Uh, and I've, I've uh, incorporated uh, some a lot of electronics in my live stage setup. So That's awesome, man. Yeah, I'm blessed, man. I, I just fell into a really perfect situation. You know, I'm so lucky. <laughs> I, really yeah, I always I think about that, though. Sometimes... I don't know. What do you think about this? Like, so, do you think sometimes like that was your destiny? It must have been because yeah. it's just I was guided there. I right. mean, it just came out from New York. I, I came in with Melissa. Uh, I spent a few years with her, and I, then I started, you know, getting around and knowing some of the guys and stuff. And one thing led to another. Yeah. It, and I kept my eyes and ears open to all opportunities. You know. And it sounds uh, like you you never got involved in like you know drug scene or anything like that. It sounds like you're, you're pretty yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, there was a, it was everywhere. Right, of course. It was everywhere, but it was up to you to yeah. you know to either control it, be cool, and do it later or whatever. You know, I opted not to. You know, yeah, yeah. in the studio, I mean, I would smoke some you know, smoke some weed and stuff like that and loosen up. But any of the other shit, the alcohol, the cocaine was nah. I didn't, yeah. Not for playing. Good for you, Did, man. Didn't work. Didn't work. Didn't work. You know. Talk about the Rolling Stones. How oh, they, how the hell did that happen? Don was. That's how it happened. That son of a gun is one of my favorite people in the world. I love him. Uh, I met him years ago when he first came on the scene with Was Not Was, and then he started mm -hmm. producing. And he just, we dig each other a lot. I dig his style. And he can go to me, and I know exactly what he wants, you know. And we have a great rapport in the studio and out of the studio, too. He's just a beautiful cat. We're so laid back. Well, he was the one who he started producing Stones. Right. And he called me up and says, I need you. I need you on the Stones. Come on. And it was it was so funny, man. So did you was, tour with them, or was that in the studio? That was in the studio. He doesn't tour. Don is in the studio. He did two... How many albums did he produce for them? Two, three, two or three albums I think he produced. Because I worked on two. Did you uh, get to play with any of the guys? I overdubbed. Okay. I overdubbed. But I did do some recording sessions. I forget who it was with. It was, uh, God, I, I did some recording sessions with Charlie Watts was playing drums. He's such a good we drummer, that dude, man. Was, oh, he's amazing. His technique is just flawless. He's just He's like a Swiss watch, man. He don't miss. Yeah. It's like, boom. Yeah. He's such a beautiful cat. And he always has his little, you know, China little teacup and stuff, man, that's got a little case and everything. Such, such a consummate gentleman, man. But an incredible groove, man. An incredible groove guy. So, And I got to hang out with, uh, I did a few things hanging out. I'm hanging out with Keith Richards on some stuff. Uh, but I never got a chance to play with the Stones, all of them together, mm. unfortunately. I always hit them up. I say, you need percussion, man. I'm first on the list. And Keith always says, you're, there is no list. You're on it. You're the only one. <laughs> you're the only one. That's funny. You're the only one. There's no list. You too. Talk about you too. Hmm? 
You too. That I got. Who was that with? That was with Rick Rubens, and I uh, that was an overdub. Holy shit, dude! You're like, I know you're not dropping names, but I'm like, every name you're dropping is like, <laughs> no, I'm like, holy shit, Rick Rubin, Don was it's like, this isn't like uh, amateur no, hour. No, 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 it's it's not. But uh, it was Rick Rubin's project that uh that, that got me into the YouTube thing, basically, and he was a. Uh, Oh, he's got me into a lot of things, you know, a lot of different things. He got me on the Adele situation um, and a few other things. The Avid Brothers, mm. which was an incredible project and a few others. But uh, I have a – hey, take it easy. Oh. Yeah, what's up with that, D? Hey, it's a Harley, bruv. You know, it's Harley country out here in, L- in California. <laughs> it's Harley country here, you know. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, I mean, Rick – I haven't worked with him recently. I don't know what he's been doing. He's a very eclectic guy. He's yeah. He's a very different cat, man. I dig him a lot. It's so funny because I first started working with him and I had to really learn about each producer has their own concept of percussion, more or less. Yeah. And uh, he's very basic. He doesn't want frills. He doesn't he just wants you to lay into the groove, you know. So I got to learn about him. And then after a few sessions he would never show up he'd leave me notes or he'd call up he says lenny you know what i want this song this song this place this place okay love you talk to me later click and it's just me and the engineer dude that's great but yeah for for a guy like him to just go you got it i don't need to be there you trust that's that's incredible trust well it's you know you earn that it's not like yeah i mean i'm not you know, you earn that. It's not like, you know, he's a good guy, so he's going to, like, not show up. It's because you've earned it, you know. You, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, you match his expectations, and you know what he's looking for. And I feel good that I can, you know, alleviate him, him not having to be there. He could do something with him, you know, go have lunch or work yeah, on yeah. another project. I mean, so I got this covered. We're good. We're That's good. awesome, man. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a good feeling to know that cats trust you that much. Yeah, but you're like you're. I'm just sitting around. Your energy is like so cool. You're just like so. Uh, you're like. Uh, um, I, you know, it's just you know the joie de vie, the love of what I do, the love of the life I have, and yeah, but that comes through. But a lot of people don't express that. You know, you got guys that are that are like, oh, I'm really happy. <laughs> you know that, yeah, right? And you're like, what? The fucking words and music are not right. matching here. You know, table. What's happening? Yeah, with that? but you know, but your energy. You're like. That that yeah. you know, es- you. especially I don't need to tell you. As you get older, people are more, either more reluctant or less physically capable yeah. of having yeah. that. You know, and and well, but it's a turn. Off. That's a turn on. That's like a magnet, man. I've been a side man for the longest time, man, and it's nice to get you know get recognized now for things. But I've always been a happy go lucky cat. Yeah. You know, just have to be as far as you know music, especially with music. You know, for me to be doing what I'm doing and have been doing it for such a long time and have made a career out of it, you know, where others would say, you need another job or yeah, you need yeah. something to fall back on. That was like the big thing, you know, but I never really listened to that. I just, I just wanted to play. So, and I wound up playing with cool, great people. You know, so. Do you know a guy in town, a session guy, Andrew Sinewick, guitar player? No, he's in LA. No. Um, he's a pretty, he's a he's he's a younger cat, but he's really doing well, up and coming, and he's mm-hmm. played on loads of movies. And I interviewed him, and then we came back because he released a second album, and uh-huh. he had he hired sidemen for the record. And I said, "What did you learn?" From, and like, so he's this is a session player. I said, "What did you learn from that?" He goes, "You know what I learned? It really taught me the value of a good attitude." I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Well." You know, it's 10 o'clock at night or midnight and the guy that's like, okay, man, yeah, let's do this again. And then I had other guys that were like, oh, I'm tired. And I (laughs) learned that I was now on the other side. He goes, Uh and I got to see that and it was very insightful to me. And I took away stuff that I'm going to, you know, I, I, he, all the calls he gets, I'm sure his attitude is great, but you know, I think this reinforced that even you know, even more, yeah, even more so. Even so more it was interesting so, yeah. to hear that. Yeah, yeah, dude, the Eagles. What'd you do with them? 
Oh, Jesus. Where is it? Oh, I, it's, 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 I have the gold album. Gold I did, record. I, I, I knew that. I got gold. I've got gold platinum albums now. So I got Toto here. And, you know, um, it was uh, The Road to Eden. Yeah. Yeah, I did that album. Yeah. Did you go on tour wrote, with them? Huh? Were you on tour with them? No, I never toured with them. Okay. No, no. That was either Rich Mangicaro or Scott Crago, who plays drums and percussion sometimes. Uh, I got to play with Glenn Fry live a couple of times. I did. What did I do with him? God bless him. Uh, the, the, that that festival in Utah. What the hell is it? I just did it with the Miles Davis thing. It's that movie festival in Utah. Oh, uh, Sundance? Sundance, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did Sundance with Glenn a couple of times and a few other gigs. But I never worked with the Eagles hmm. uh, live. Hmm. Um, but I've known, I mean, I've known all of them individually, you know, um, uh, Henley, I know through, uh, through Stevie Nicks, he was always coming, you know, coming by, um, Joe, Joe Walsh, uh, he's one of my favorite people in the world. He's what, such a, what a, what a, what a talented dude, man. You know what? A funny story about him, man. I knew about the James game before I came out to, to LA my parents turned me on to the first James Gang album. Uh, the what was it called? Um, it was. It had your the, album? No. Um, it was a blue. I think it was a. It had a picture of them in the middle of it. It was like the the very first one they had with uh, Funk Forty Nine. Yeah, right. And, 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 and it was my parents. That's so cool. They heard it. My parents at that time. That's not what born. like Puerto Ricans families were listening to no, either no, at all. Please. Oh, not but, even remotely. But my parents were their their collection was very eclectic. My mother loved country western uh, along with the Latin music, the salsa. My dad, my stepdad, uh, was into jazz and Latin jazz. And on the weekends, we would listen to Dick Ricardo, Sugar, and Symphony Sid, and the, the, those great Symphony stations. Symphony Sid, that's way back. Yeah. Oh my, I'm t I'm going way way back. You know, and my parents. I mean, I listened to a lot of different things. I listened to classical music. I'd listen. One of my favorite bedtime storytellers was Lord Buckley. That's so funny, man. You hit the Lord Buckley? No, it sounds like something that was on the radio, though. Dude, no. This guy was the bohemian storyteller. He would tell stories about, like, Gandhi and Jesus of Nazareth, but in hip talk. Lord Buckley. I'm going to check that dude out. Dude. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. He's amazing. And my parents were hip to that. And I would listen to all that stuff. They had. So, like I said, getting back to the James Gang thing, my mom was shopping in S. Klein department. Yeah, store. I remember that. Holy you shit. I haven't heard yeah, that name I'm, in a. I'm, I'm, wow. Wow. I yeah. haven't heard that name in a. My mom is walking by the music department. She hears the stink. <laughs> says, I heard it. So I asked the guy, he says, Oh, it's this guy. So I bought it. Here. That's so, so cool. I was like, then I came out to L.A. and I got to meet the guys, and that was a whole different thing, man. But my parents were a major part of my education. I mean, I, I, I was a human vacuum cleaner for music, yeah. cartoons, TV. When I was a kid, I would, when I was really small, I would run in just for the commercials, listen to the commercials of the music, and then when the the show started, I'd run back to my room. <laughs> I mean, I remember commercials from when I was a kid, you know, the old Plop Plop Fizz Fizz yeah, and yeah. Uh, the old uh, um, Led Hurts bring you to the driver's seat, you know, old Rheingold, Rheingold, Rheingold my beer, yeah. Rheingold, the, you know, I remember. That's so funny. They used to, but there were a lot of good commercials back then. Like our, there were a lot of jingles back, back I, then, like yeah. about hotels, even down in the city. I can't, yeah. you know, like uh, the Essex house, all these hotels <laughs> yes. would have uh, yes. proper yes. full length yeah. You know, so melodies. I, grabbed, I grabbed music from everywhere, everywhere. And being in New York, you know, that was a playground. Yeah. Music. And I listened to everything. I mean, the music was full of incredible pop music. I loved classical country resting through my mom. I mean, I was totally surrounded by music my whole life. And since and I've been playing since I was three years old. So, What did um, you do with the, the Chili Peppers, Lenny? I did yeah. a couple of them. Did I do California Cajun? Wow. I did a couple of things with them. In all in the studio. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful guys. Chad is a you know, beautiful they're all beautiful cats, man. Chad is a motherfucker. 
How, how did you get hooked up with those guys? Who, who turned you on to those? I don't know. You know, sometimes I just get called. People hear about me or know about me from other things, and uh, they call up the nearest contractor or somebody and say, you know, these guys are looking for you. Wow. Come. You know, sometimes have, it's not just, you know, you're knowing the guys. Sometimes they don't know who you are, but they know. They just know of your you work. Do. Yeah. Your I'm a hired gun. I've always been a hired gun for the longest time. You know, have you maybe. toured with anybody besides Melissa and uh, Toto? Boz. I did Boz, Boz Cat. Right. I did Ricky Lee Jones. I toured with uh, Stevie Nicks. I did Fleetwood Mac. I did Joe Sample. We toured for a long time. Um, the Joe Sample days were... That was uh, I was playing trio with Joe, and I was playing drums and percussion. I had a 360 setup. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah, we did seven years, man. And I'm, I think there are a couple of albums that I actually did with him that I actually played drums. There's one album I did with him where Gad is on half and I'm the other half. That's pretty funny. Well, it scared the hell out of me because I didn't know. And when the album came out, I said, holy shit. I'm, 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 I'm. What right record? What album that. is that? Do you know? What was the title of that? Um, oh Jesus! It could be Old Places, Old Faces, or P Country. I forget exactly. You might have to do a little research on that because my my mind is a little bit blurry on that. But I could probably but, get an all music a look up your name. Mm -hmm. I could get. Oh all, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, That's it's crazy. it's crazy. That's really but cool. that was so much fun, man. Doing a trio with Joe Sample. Joe was every night was. An adventure in music. We even though we played the same songs, every night was an adventure, and, and you never knew where Joe was gonna go. And I always, man, I would be in the shower right before gig time and getting ready, going, man, I can't wait to get on stage because me and Joe and Jay Anderson, we're just gonna kick some ass, you know. And he did that gig for seven years. That's a long time. Seven years. We did seven years straight, man. It was the big. It was big fun. Big fun. And I. I mean, I learned a lot. I was learning on the job how to do a double thing. I mean, I was like... Yeah, yeah, that's not easy at all. He gave me, man, Jay, I, I mean, Joe, Joe gave me so much musically and as a friend, and he just told me, I want something different. Come up with something different. And I did it, and I was learning on the job. Every night I was learning different combinations of things, and you know... And Joe was sucking it up too because he was trying to remember his own music. <laughs> Funny man, uh, I miss him a lot, man. He was he was family. He was definitely family. How'd you how'd you hook up with Doug and Los Lobotomies? Well, uh, I I've, I've been with Los Lobotomies for the long time, and for the longest time, I mean, I came up with the name, as a matter of fact. I'm the. <laughs> I didn't know that. How did you come up with that? Oh, dude, I was. Hung over, having to get up early to go to a stupid rehearsal uh... and stuff. And for some reason, it was part of a rave from the night before. We were raving about, like, it just seemed like there was always lost this and lost that. And I just came up, well, we should be lost lobotomies and, you know, be a, a whole bunch of musicians who have been lobotomized by all the crazy sessions we've had to do. You That's know? funny, man. You came up with that name. That's awesome. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty insane. <laughs> hey man, I want to let's talk about your your record a little bit. First of all, congratulations on it, man! Coming out with a record is is not an easy thing, and um, very very proud of it, man. Very you should be. It's a great record, and and you know what too? I think I think it takes a lot of courage, actually, as successful as you are, man. You ain't you ain't lying. Yeah, to say okay, I want to make uh, you know uh, you know fifty years as a side man, and now there's a certain amount of balls it takes to do that, man. So I give you a lot of credit. Well, Especially in this day and age where record companies don't exist anymore. Right. I mean, there are a few, but they are for upper echelons. They're for people like, now. Nah, I don't run in those circles, the Beyonce's and the... Yeah, yeah. But I, you know what I'm talking about. Well, you about. run in those circles, but not as an artist. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was... Uh, it was such a... Uh, 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 I mean, it wasn't the easiest thing. First of all, I came up with all this music. And when I turned 60, my wife looks at me and she goes, okay, now what are you going to do? See, that's why you need a strong woman, man. I love a, my wife's like that. You know, you got to have a strong yeah. woman. It's just, you know, you got to, I had a, I had a nice little time off with the, the Toto guys. And, uh, and I said, well, shit, all right, I'm going to start recording. So I started taking things and uh, putting them, uh, finishing off the songs, basically the compositions. Right. Taking them and putting them on Pro Tools. And I brought uh, this incredible engineer friend of mine, uh, uh, Jordan Silva, who I got from 
Rick Rubens. And this kid is a genius. He's Pro Tools and Ears of Gold. I trust him implicitly. And he helped me put the whole thing together, send out files. And, and it was so funny, man, because I would send out files to Mike Landau, Ricky Peterson. The, and when I get the files back, their files, and put it into the music, each song would just grow. I mean, little by oh, little. So, and you didn't, you didn't have any expert. You didn't know what to expect because you hadn't done this before. So it was like, uh, no, oh, it was I mean, probably really cool for you to experience yeah, that. I was sending them the songs, and I had already parts. I had guitar parts and stuff that I did um, that were on GarageBand, but they sounded like shit, you know. But <laughs> I did my parts, and I would tell them, I have a part there. Stay close to the part, but give me lots of love. Right. You know, make it yours. You know, I do have a part there. That's your guy. That's it. That's all, you know, that's all I would say. And then at the end, I would say just give your love on it, you know. So you wrote, the, you put this together, like you had melodies in your head and you put it together in GarageBand. Yeah. That's so cool, Great man. Keyboards, keyboards. In fact, a lot of my keyboards stayed on and I just added guys. Right. I added Garfield to uh, one thing, a couple of things, uh, Ricky Peterson, uh, Neil Larson. Uh, uh, I added some keyboards. on. I had, you know, a few guys. To, to give me some stuff, you know. Aside, but my parts were so cool that I just left them in there and just bury you. them, you know, just leave them in there because they were so much a part of the songs, you know. Did you have that thing where it sounds like you did not, like you didn't get caught up in uh, over analyzing things? Oh man, that is the worst thing to do. That but is it's you tough start, when it's your own it self, yeah, for well, a lot of people, you know, especially. I stop myself, you know, you have to. There were so many lessons that I had told other people being a sideman that I had to tell myself. Right. Number one, get away from the demo. The demo is the demo. Like, for example, the drum parts. I, I was trying to think of who was going to play drums. I came up with Sonny Emery, Greg Bissonnet, this guy, this guy. And it was like, damn, that means I'm going to have studio, and then I got to get drums. And I just, uh, and I said, wait a minute, I'm a drummer. What the fuck am I doing? Yeah, right. So then I said, do not, you know, yeah. come on. It's it's time to, you know, to get busy here. So that's when I went to Doug, and I went, I said, let me use your drums, man. And he said, no problem. So I did that, you know, but it was, it was a process. I had to teach myself a lot of things like that. You know, and to not overanalyze things, you know, not not don't get uh, what I call scritty polity on shit. You yeah, know? yeah. Analysis paralysis. <laughs> Just yeah. Let it go. Let it go. You know, I mean, quarterly, make sure I like, you know, it's like writing music is a very math. It's like writing mathematical equations. Things just fit. Right. Words fit. Rhythms fit. And you got to find out where they do. And sometimes I go out of the box and do some really weird chords, like Big Meat. I got some really strange shit in there, man. That whoever's going to make a fucking copy of that chart is going to have a headache for forever. <laughs> because there's some shit in there that I don't even understand how I came up with it. But you know, but um, it, it 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 was an incredible experience, man. And I love the fact that it came out the way it did. You know, no pretense, no, no attitude. No, I'm the best motherfucker. This, that. No, it's just music. This is me, my life, my music. And you know, it's cool. There's a little bit. Not every song, but most of the songs is a little Latin in it, all of them, <laughs> which is really cool. I mean, that's what I was saying before. I was like, man, yeah. you can hear this is very, con you know, it's very consistent. The whole, it's, it's. Right. You know, and the so the songs all fit together too, in the structure of how you organize them, which is not an easy thing. Oh man, thank you, Craig. Man, that's please. Um, uh, thank you for such beautiful words, man. Like oh, I said, tell me how I feel, man. Just it's fun, really man. Nice. Just fun. I, I, you know, I went with things that even the artwork. You know, the artwork basically was yeah. What from, was that? Like I, a, a ribbon in your hands or something? It's a it's a it's a, it's a red sash in my hand and it actually came from an idea from a Ayrto album called fingers mm -hmm. Ayrto had this beautiful and it's a, supposed to be a well-known photograph of this guy's hands and it's kind of a reddish tint and i always that album fingers i wore that shit out that <laughs> that album just schooled me i tell you Ayrto was my teacher and didn't even know it and when i told him about it when i met him He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> you, I told him, you taught me. I listened to your stuff. 
That's cool, man. Yeah, so I basically got the idea for that, and then the red sash across was my wife's idea. It was we took a and it, it just kind of just came together. I used Instagram, no, not Instagram. I used um, Hipstamatic from my phone to take the photograph. A friend of ours in Japan, a graphic artist, made the sash red. It, originally, it was pink. Ah, uh, okay. He made it red. So, dude, you technological it out on the whole thing, man. <laughs> yeah, I was getting love from all sides. There you go. Well, that's because it was it was obviously meant to be, man. Yeah, I guess. That's how you got to look at it. You know, it's yeah. just like I asked you earlier. Don't you think, so? you know, because there's so many things like happen serendipitously like that. Mm. I, I often question, regardless of, of like whatever religion or non-religion, I question, is it, you know, something's got to be guiding some of this stuff at some times, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. something is, you know, but I don't question that. I just go with it. Oh, you have to. You can't sit there and analyze. No, it's, it's just, like yeah, you said, you can't start analyzing. Just say thank you and, you know, that's it. And go and, yeah. and go with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I so, want to talk about a couple of the songs in there uh, that I really mm -hmm. like. Slinky Strut, great funky groove there, great mm -hmm. funky guitars, and the really cool sound like a tenor on there, right? Yes. Yeah. Who who is that Doug playing guitar on that? Yeah, I think Doug's on there. Yeah. Uh, Doug's pretty much almost on everything, and I added some guys. I forget. I don't have a copy. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't have a copy here to tell you. But um, is there a backstory to that song, Slinky Strut? No, a lot of them don't have that much. I mean, it was just a matter of just you know, I wrote things, and that was it. There was really no story behind them, right? You know, Slinky Strut. Actually, the name. I was thinking of um, what's a, 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 an old jazz song called Along Came Betty. And that song was written about a chick who just had the most beautiful walk. So, and so that song kind of, strut, that, yeah. I kind, of, kind of got that idea, the idea from that, from Along Came Betty, just a, a strut, you know, a beautiful, nice strut, a slinky strut. But she's, you know, I guess basically that's where I got it from. You know. And the other song I liked a lot was El Tres. Great. El Tres. Great. Yeah. What I liked was the solo, the guitar solo was killer in there. That's Luke. That's Lucather. That was freaking Dude, phenomenal. I, you know what I did, man? I got everything ready, brought my engineer. We went to Steve Picaro's studio, and I made sure. I didn't want to overplay it. I didn't want, I just wanted solos from him. So I just had everything ready in the studio sound and everything in his sound. And I just said, play. I want to solo here. I want to solo here like here. And then when he was done, I said, that's it. You're done. Yeah. It's incredible I, solo. I mean, he's I, shredding oh, the shit out of the guitar. He just there, poured out his love, man. And I was like, oh, ho, 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 ho. record everything. But the piano, really? what was good is that the piano is like swinging right with the guitar. Mm -hmm. So I thought mm -hmm. that was really cool. Who's on piano? Who's, who's that piano? I, who's on piano on that? It might be me. Uh, on El Tres, I forget. Yeah, it was great, man. I really dug it. Thank and, you. Thank any, you. Any backstory to that song? Well, El Tres, <laughs> it's actually, I named it. I have a friend of mine in Kobe. He's a hairdresser who's also my fishing guru. And his shop is called El Tres. Oh, shit. That's really he cool. Had three buddies. So I just used it. I, I love the name. I told him I'm going to write a song for, you know, using that. So El Tres means the three. So yeah. I wrote it in kind of a six, eight, or like a three type of thing. And the song kind of grew from that, from that idea, oh. believe it or not. Very cool, man. Yeah, thank you. Let thank me you. ask you, what, if you could answer this, you, what would you say, just a knee-jerk reaction, top three music experiences you've had? Oh, gosh. Mm. Well, Joe Sample, definitely. That whole thing that I did with Joe Sample, the trio thing, was an incredible learning experience for me. Um, man, you know, I've had so many great experiences. Right. That's why I knew it's a tough question. Oh, you know, from you know, from playing uh, on the Fugitive, the movie The Fugitive with with Harrison with Ford. Harrison Ford, yeah. Yeah, I got to play a lot of percussion on that and con guys with with a bunch of other percussionists. Um, what was so special about that? Just the excitement, you know, was a Alan Silvestri situation, man. It was just I got to play, I got I got free hand on a lot of conga stuff. Nothing, you know, my chart was like play, 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 no notation. 
That's really you know, cool. Fill the blanks, you know, or playing with the Stones. That you know, oh my God, so many, so many incredible experiences that I've had. Uh, the Fleetwood Mac situation that was big. When I did the dance with them, that was major. The DVD that we did, that was a very special occasion, stuff like that. But so many. Which Fleetwood Mac? Which band? Who was playing guitar? Uh, well, Lindsay was there. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. Lindsay, and I think we had Neil Hayward on acoustic behind him. Yeah, we always had an extra guitar player. Yeah, I think it was Neil Hayward on okay. on the second second guitar, but it was basically Lindsay. Lindsay. Yeah. Where in, where in the city did you grow up? Manhattan. I was born in Manhattan and spent a lot of time in, in the Bronx. And we also lived down in Bed-Stuy, like Newkirk and Flatbush and Brooklyn for Brooklyn. a while. So yeah. Basically the yeah. city, but mainly Manhattan, uptown east side, you know, 101st between 3rd and Lexington. I thought they were going to knock that building down. Somebody bought <laughs> it and they're refurbishing it. It's going to go for a billion dollars. Unbelievable. Just recently, a friend of mine said, he said, hey, man, you remember that building you used to live in? I said, yeah, man, it's still up. He says, not only is it still up, somebody, some yuppie bought it and they're redoing it. And he sent me a picture of it. There was scaffolding on the outside, man. They're just, you know, it's going to go for a billion dollars. Yeah. But that was yeah. a. But that's, that's happened to all those neighborhoods. All those neighborhoods, yeah, pretty yeah, much. Well, all the yuppies and uh, all the, the the new money people come in and say, oh, that's beautiful old structure and look at that molding and. Yeah, I know that's the way it's going. The thing I, I miss is uh like, like Bleecker Street. That was my favorite street in the city. Oh, yeah. And you go down there now, it's like, it's not really. It's like a, a even Forty Second Street a boot 40... store where you could spend eight hundred dollars on a pair of boots. Like yeah. who the fuck is doing that? You know, I never, I, I never feared for my life in. You know, I, we had some interesting situations. Well, but I'll tell you what, man. The mid seventies were really rough there, bro. The seventies, sixties, seventies. You know, that, that was a little. I never dicey. really had that many problems. You know, um, like the the pimps were. You know, if if they, I would always get you know, you know, good words from the from the street people. You know, hey man, you keep on practicing. And I'd be walking down the street with my congas. Yeah. You know, or you'd pass by a. Going down to Third Street Music School, you pass by the uh, the Hell's Angels headquarters, and the guys were like, "Anybody fuck with you, you let us know." We're, you know, yeah, because just... there was that neighborhood thing. You were like doing them proud, so exactly. was, yeah, that was no one was going to mess with it was you there. Yeah. Community it was a yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. They cared, yeah. even if they were pimps or yeah. bikers or whatever or gangbangers. Yeah. There was there was a neighborhood thing, man. That yeah. just. No, but if you had a good kid like you, that that you're that it was safe, man. You know, nobody yeah. would bother you. I you stayed know. out of major problems, yeah. you know. I do some stupid things here and now and here and there, but you know, I, I the the cops didn't know who I was, of and course. I stayed. You know. Mm. Hey, is there any um what, any low points or dark periods that you had, and how'd you get through them? Hmm. 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 That's interesting. Um. I. You know, when I was with Toto in the beginning, you know, I wasn't signed with them and I really got depressed because I wasn't asked to sign. But eventually, Jeff Picaro kind of straightened me out on it. I got very depressed. Because you didn't Jeff have a was, contract with the label. Yeah, I wasn't asked to sign. You know, it was just them. Yeah, yeah. And, um, there were some circumstances that I didn't know, some, some weird things that went on with the record company trying to keep it a certain color. Things a certain color. Holy shit! I think. Yeah, it was Even weird. In, there was. You're kidding me. It was a lot of you know the record companies would have their own idea. We want it like this. It should look like this. And, but you know, I never really paid that much attention to it. Uh, I wanted to be. I, I started wondering how come I'm not a part of the group. I've been with them since the beginning. But like I was saying, I came back from a Stevie Wonder tour. And I went to Jeff's house, Jeff Vaccaro, and I said, Jeff, you know, I was raving about how great of a time I had. And he just looked at me and said, I can't do what you do. You know, I, you know, fuck you. I, you know, if I have to, if I want to go out, I have to ask record companies, agents, managers. I have to get permission from all these people. You, you just go. You're lucky. So then I started going, hmm, maybe... 
I should shut my mouth, you know, and right. just go, you know, realize. And basically what he was telling me that I was lucky that I wasn't signed. Because, right. No, I get it. You know, I, there was a ball and chain for them. And I was flying around doing all kinds of stuff when they weren't doing something. I was like, yeah, see you later. Call me for the next record or the next tour. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of he brought me down to earth on that, you know, and I brought my head out my ass and, and I started thinking, you know, properly. And then the only other situation was when my for my first wife passed away in '98 uh, oh of God. cancer. That was that was a heavy uh, watching her die for three years and oh then have to raise my kids. Yeah, you know? and um, oh, and the lady you just saw, my my wife now she saved me. She pulled me out of the depths of of depression. Dude, and I, I wasn't expecting. I was that very lucky. An answer, to, man. You know. I, yeah, it was oh, heavy. Shit, that is... And she was a singer, too, and she was a background vocalist. She toured with Toto, Donna Summers, Frankie mm -hmm. Vashi. She sang on Forrest Gump. She sang on some other movies. She was quite uh, in the business, you know. But that was, a, that was a very tough situation to have to deal with. But, oh, uh, my God. Lenny. Man, but like I'm I said, so sorry that you had to experience that, man. My, my wife now, she, she saved me. She uh, she pulled me out of that 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 darkness. So uh, wow. I have a lot to thank, for, especially to her, right, Chia? Hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm saver. She's a saver. Wow, man, I wasn't expecting that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry well, you had to deal with that, man. Uh, let me let me tell you why I'm like tripping is because my wife had cancer in '98. Really? Oh, yeah. My and she, I mean, Did thank she yeah, she's here. Thank God, yeah. Oh. Bless her, man. I know, but so every time I hear that, I, and I know how, I mean, in a bad deck of cards, we got some, we pulled the best ones there, and we are, and I, and I have been thankful for that every single day of my life. But you know, yeah. when I hear this, it's like, fuck, yeah. man. So I'm, I'm. Uh, you know, life has a way of throwing things, man. You just yeah. don't know where it's going to come from, and then you don't even know how you're going to deal with it when things do come down. Yeah. You know? No, that's for and sure. I worried about my kids, basically. I didn't really worry about myself, and then. You know, eventually my daughter was like, you know, pulling my coattail going, hey, dad, you know, you OK? You clean the kitchen three times. What's happening? <laughs> oh, and, How old were your kids well, at the time? Oh, they were oh, God, 14 and 16. Holy smokes, man. Wow. Yeah, it was rough. Yeah, it was rough. They still it's it's something that you, you know, when you lose your mother it's, it's at an early age. You know, there, I just yeah. There's no. I mean, it's like you know, that's it's not like a fixable problem. That's not a fixable thing. No. You know, but man, I'm really sorry. Thank you for um. It's okay. Sharing that, man. Like really I said, it's a, part, it's a part of life, and you know, I I really had to bear down, and I like I said, I wanted to raise my kids and make sure that they were okay. Yeah. yeah. That's why I neglected myself because I wanted them to make sure that they knew that there was still kind of a there was still a family unit there even though the mother was not there. oh of so. course yeah 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 you have you can't be you have to be selfless in that and you have to be selfless as a parent as it is as it is <laughs> but in that situation it's like amplified because now you're being selfless and you're on you're doing solo it's it's tough yeah. and i give you credit man thank you thank you brother thanks for sharing that man oh yeah hey um is in, in looking back is there any if you had to give yourself advice anything you would tell yourself that would have made your life easier assuming you would have listened <laughs> That's a good, yeah. Oh gosh! I, I, you know, sometimes I wish I would have had some more business sense. I mean, not that I've done any bad business, but I think maybe a little bit more business sense would have been a good thing. But, eh, I, I've, I've done okay. I've done okay. Do you know, uh, that's the number one answer I get with that question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah. musicians, I mean, that's something that we don't, you know, things change so much in our business. It's hard to really nail down, tell people, you know, this is what you should do because you never know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. You know, and to make sure that you have your finances right and, you know, everything right, and bank accounts. You know, when I first started, I came out to L.A. I was 19 and I had no license. I had no bank account. I was a musician and I was single. Banks wouldn't even look at me. I says, yeah, I want to open an account. Okay, how old are you? 19. Uh-oh, no. Okay. Really? Uh, you couldn't open an account? because you're, you're, you, you're, you're a musician. That's strike two. 
You know, you're single. Strike three. Sorry, sir. But fortunately, what happened was wow. Melissa Manchester had a friend who was in charge of the entertainment business. I think it was Wells Fargo at the time. Mm. And he was in charge of, they had an entertainment department at that bank. Right. So she told me, go see Mr. Blah Blah. I forget his name. He was really nice. Very, very nice Jewish man. And he was, oh, yes, Melissa, I love her. She's my little girl. What do you need? I need a bank account. Like, you got it. You got to put the money in there. Da, da, da. So you got to sort it out. Yeah. Sort it out. You know. That's funny, but man. I was like, you know, I was getting turned down by these banks. And I was going, what am I going to do here? That's really weird that someone's turning down money, to be honest with you. Like, that, that, that. Uh, you know, they didn't want, you know, a, a young Puerto Rican kid from New York who was single and a musician. Yeah, but you want to give them money. I mean, it's not like you're asking for anything. It, it seems uh, weird. They, you know, a lot of them were had very stringent rules and whatever. So That's weird. But I, got, Dude, I had a, a dollar I, savings bank. I had an account when I was like 15. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work at that bank in Park. Yeah. Um, man, who are some of the, uh, you've, I, I, if you could even answer this, who are some of the guitar players that you've really enjoyed playing with? Ooh. Well, I got to say Luke at their number yeah. one. Joe Bonamassa, number two. Joe is a motherfucker. He's he's just a, he's a fierce player, that yeah. kid. He's amazing. I love working with him, and I love listening to him play. Uh, Mike Landau. Ugh. Yeah. Oh. He's, uh, he's, he's in a whole category in his own his sound and his style is just amazing um well i just have to i have to interject that hendrix was a major force in my in my upbringing he changed my life uh when he died i stopped doing anything else other than music I, in fact i was delivering newspapers i was getting ready to deliver the new york post the afternoon edition yeah that's right i remember that. up after school Right. Looked at the paper and it said Hendrix is dead. I threw the bundle down and I looked at the boss and I said, "You're delivering these today. I quit." Wow. Now. And all you did was he was like, "No, you fucking asshole! You can't do that! You can I said, "Bro, I'm sorry. This is a sign that I can't do anything but music from now on." That was pretty mature of you to <laughs> think like that, man. Dude, that's how heavy Hendrix was, man. I was turned on to Hendrix by. The friend of this little kid, I became like a a, a, a a bodyguard to this young kid who was being bullied quite a bit. And he had a brother who was a drummer. And this kid had a drum set in his room, took up the whole room. And he said, man, I'm going to turn you on to something. And he put on, are you experienced? That's it. My head just imploded. I'm like, are you serious? And I listened to it, and I ran. I said, Mom, I got to go buy an album. He says, well, you know, but go buy an album. Go to the record store, buy it. Man, he just changed my life. Wow. And then when he passed away, that was like confirmation. Like, dude, you have to commit. It's time to commit. And I did. And I never did another gig aside from music after that. That's so cool. And you haven't done anything since. Well, that that's amazing, been man. That's Thank God, man. No yeah, man, that's a great story. But let's see, what are the guitar players? Such um there was a Brazilian Zagovia. He was an incredible guitar player. I listened to a lot of guitar players. There were a lot of great cats, you know. But those that yeah. I taught were you know, there's a lot of other cats that are fantastic, but those were the ones that were closest to my heart. Desert Island Discs, man. Knee jerk reaction, top three. What's that? Desert Island Des Discs. <laughs> Top three. God. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? You used to, do you ever read that in Tower Records, right? Wouldn't you read yes. the magazine Desert Island Discs? And they, oh my God! Uh, Miles, Island. Okay, number one, Milestone by Miles Davis. Uh, number two, Weather Report. Um, uh, you know the, the 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 big one with Manolo Badrena. What was it? Uh, not Heavy Weather. It had palladium in it, and I don't know weather report, man. I never listen to them. To be honest with you, really? Never. <laughs> no, I get turned on to so much music. I don't think I've even heard a weather report in the top three. Yeah, huh? I don't think you're the first guy I think who's brought up weather report for a top three. Oh man, weather report! I've been into them since they first started. 
their very, very beginning. You know? Like, what are they, like jazz? Yeah, fusion jazz. Okay. But since, you know, Zawal knew when, you know, he, he totally screwed people up using all kinds of thin synthesizers and stuff. And, man, and he's the one, Joe Zawal was the one who wrote Mercy, Mercy. da 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 and, you know, Cannonball song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That song I know, Mercy. Yeah, Joe Zawal wrote that. I'm gonna have to. So, what album should I? What album do you like for Weather Report? Uh, what do I, I need I, to listen to? Um, it, what's the What's the one? There's one with Palladium in it. I I can't think of it. I can't get it right now. Hold, hold on one second. Give me one second. Yeah, man. Let me go to my okay albums. Look at the world we live in. Hold on, let me look at my phone. I'll get you the name of the album. <laughs> what? A, no. Is it crazy? Isn't it? I mean, I, I know I sound like a dinosaur because no, that's just, man, it's but true. it's like it's holy true. shit. Okay, artist. Okay, okay. Okay, here weather report. Okay. I think it's heavy weather. Heavy weather. Yeah. But just about any of their albums, you know. And what would be number, uh, what would be number three? Number three. Oh gosh. Miles Weather Report. There's there's an album that George Clinton did with the P Funk mm-hmm. All Stars that I think is like a a bible of funk. It's called. Uh, I'm going to have to find it for you because I can't remember the name of it. Um, where am I? Where am I? Here we go. Uh, since you're, since, while you're looking for this, what do you, what do you okay. think of uh, James the Funky Drummer? That's like one of my favorite albums of all time. But James Brown, do you know that record? Oh man, any of James Brown stuff, man. I was raised. I that used to go so, see Apollo. Did you really? Yeah, I used to go That's see so James cool. Brown see Apollo, man. The, the, I don't I don't remember who the drummers were at the time, but they were funky, man. I mean, it was. Amazing, but this this George Clinton, yeah, it's it's uh, George Clinton and the, uh, it's actually called T A P O A F O. Is the name of the record T A P O Tapofo T A P O A F O, which means the awesome power of a funk overlord or something like that. Awesome, <laughs> you know, dude, I've got to check that. But the album today. is just amazing. It's an amazing album as far as funk. And uh, just to interject, I'm going to have to throw in a fourth one. This, there's this kid named Anderson Pack that my son turned me on to, who's an amazing drummer, singer, composer. And the kid's just amazingly talented. So I've been starting to listen to him a lot. Very cool, man. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I listen to a lot of the things, you know, stuff. But those are the basics right there. New York City food you miss the most. <laughs> Sabret hot dogs. Really? Oh, that's <laughs> interesting. No, actually, Needix. Needix, yeah, yeah, the Orange Julius. The orange drink that yeah. they used to have. Needix orange had Julius, drink, yeah, yeah. And the hot dog, but they had a relish that they used to make <laughs> that was monstrous. It was like sweet and, yeah, I know they were, yeah. That's oh, so funny. God. Yeah, I remember, you know, going shopping, you know, we're going to the department store, and I, if we went to S. Klein, which was downtown, there was a Needix right there. And That's I so was, funny. Needix. Sabret hot but, dogs and Needix. That's great, man. <laughs> what? What? And, and a good cherry cheese knish. And a cherry cheese knish. That's so <laughs> funny. What? From the boardwalk in Brighton Beach. Yeah, that's going way back, man. Yeah, I'm telling you. What's been for you the most challenging aspect of being in the limelight? Where, like, you know, you're the guy but you're clearly like totally grounded like so how do you well, number, one, number one i stay away from the limelight i never go i'm not looking for the limelight i've never been i've always been happy being in the background and because of the fact that i've done so many things people start noticing wow this guy's done this and done that so it's kind of kind of on its own yeah uh, taking off a life of its own just not yeah just a life of its own nothing that i've done or nothing that i've thought about no, it's it's just uh, just do and enjoy, and hope that people enjoy what you're doing. You know, which will keep you working. Yeah, yeah, man. That's the one thing that I always is 
kind of in the back of your head of geez, am I playing okay? You know, the older you get, you're going like, I hope I'm, I hope I'm still cool. Right. You know, right. I hope I'm still, my faculties are still here, and but I'm still okay so far. You know, but you worry about that because when you're in the front of the pack all the time, you get used to being in the front of the pack. Right. And and I, I I've done that not purposefully, just because of what I've done. Yeah. You know. It's funny. Right. There was a video of you I saw on YouTube, and man, it was really nice because, um, I think it was a Toto guys. I wasn't sure who was. somebody was recording you. You were in the room playing congas. And you knew you were being recorded and you, you were doing a session, but it was really nice because you were like, you know, smiling and, you know, you're, <laughs> you were just having fun with it. And it was like, yeah. I didn't know you at all. And I just said, man, this guy seems like a very fun, you're just a genuinely a fun guy. And that, oh, man, I really think that that comes off. I, I, you know, you're one of the, like that, you've got that positive. Yeah thing running through you, you very genuinely man and i think that's thank like you. it's such a great quality that in any profession like who the hell wouldn't want to be around you <laughs> yeah i mean seriously I, someone's got to do your job even if you well, sucked I, at it to be honest my, with you my wife tells me that you know the uh, just the, how strong my energy is yeah, especially great on stage. she says on stage my energy just kind of really takes over but that can also be, you got to be careful with that, you know, to have that kind of power to project your energy, you have to be careful. Yeah, but you're you not know, that guy. That's not, that's, you don't, yeah. have, you, you got to be aware. You don't have to be careful because you're not that guy. You're not looking to do anything with it. No, no. You know, there's no bad intent there. So it's like, you know, <laughs> if, if there's an issue, it's going to be on somebody else's part, not through something you've done, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, that's I like I almost to the point where like even if you sucked, it didn't matter because you just want to be around that guy. Which you know I'm saying though. I mean I'm yeah, the energy, just, yeah. yeah, it's just like fuck. Let's you know th th this guy's gonna make this a better project. Well, regardless. you know that's funny because I did a I did an album with Jim Messina from Loggins and Messina. Yeah, yeah, sure. He he called me up and he had a studio up in Santa Barbara. I don't know if he still has it, but he was doing a week of recordings, and he said I want you to come up. And I said, okay, should I bring, what gear do you want? He says, don't bring, just bring your shakers. <laughs> and I said, well, what, what do you mean? He says, well, I'm not going to record you. I just want your groove to help the drummer. Dude, that's what I'm saying. And so that's what I did all week. I was just, me and the drummer kind of locked and nothing, I don't think any of, they might've recorded some of it, but all they did was play shaker to, 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 to give it a little bit of a feel. <laughs> yeah, like, but so there you go, man. But they paid me. I mean, they right. paid me. There you go. Session. Imagine yeah. getting paid for a session because of the vibe you're bringing. That happens. I mean, that's that awesome. Happens. But you yeah. made that, man. You made that happen. So it didn't just happen. You made yeah. it happen, you know? So, I mean, I think that's so freaking awesome. Very cool. Very, You know, I think it's a, a, a great gift that, that you have, basically, to be honest. Thank with you. Man. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. Very man. Um, Most important thing your dad taught you. Um, well, my, my stepdad was the gentleman who raised me, my real father and my mother separated earlier, but I did get, did have a relationship with my real dad. So do but, both if you want, most important thing, yeah, your stepdad well, and most important thing, your biological my, dad. My, my, my real father, it was the music, the love, the, the love for music and the way he approached it, you know, was just vicious, just jump in and go and play. And my stepdad taught me how what it is to be a man, to fight, defend myself, earn my own money, you know, and be a good person. You know, he really made me a man, my stepdad. Mm -hmm. And he was, God bless him, he was such a spaz. He would take my bongos and say, you should play them like this. <laughs> and he, he was a spaz. He <laughs> music, but he just wasn't a musician. And then he realized, I don't know what I'm doing. You, 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 you know. <laughs> But he, was so, but he inspired me. He pushed me. He says, you know, when I get disappointed, I'd be practicing. Oh, I can't play this. He says, dude, go out, hang with your friends, come back tomorrow and play. You'll get it. That's really Don't cool. Don't push us. That's you good. Know? good advice. And he also screamed at the neighbors, you know, when they were hollering, shut those drums up. And, he goes, and he'd go, and just because your son's a junkie doesn't mean you have to scream. <laughs> you know, like, you know, Holy shit. Of, the said, of course. Yeah, yeah. That's great, like, man. You play. You play. <laughs> yeah, man. That's, fuck it. 
How about yeah, your mom? I, What's the most important thing she taught you? Oh, love. Just her love, man. Just her love and her cooking and her understanding uh, of me wanting to be a musician. It was tough for her because uh, her her relationship with my real dad ended very uh, when I was when uh, very early. I think I was maybe two or three. Hmm. And I, I think she just had a she had a broken heart after that situation, you know. So she she was very angry at my real dad. So she didn't. She was worried about me being a musician and turning it to him. Being that yeah, about that guy yeah. yeah. But later on in life, I realized, Ma, this is your luggage. It's not mine. Yeah, you know, it, really it was cool your that you, you you came. So from. you know, I I found my dad, my real dad, and we we we're still very, we're very close now. I'm I'm you know That's definitely. Nice. Is he still? He, the, are they both still in the city? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, they're still in there. Dad's upstate, and mom's out in Long Island. Do you go back yeah. there often? I said, yeah, but not enough. Not enough. I got to go back more. You know, whenever I'm in, in the area, right? Tour stuff like that, I go back. But uh, I should go back more often. <laughs> Sorry, ma. No, <laughs> man, she gets it. <laughs> She's cool. Do you have any hobbies outside of music, Lenny? Oh yeah, uh, I love to fish. Like? Saltwater love- or freshwater? Both. Yeah, I love fishing. Certain- it's so relaxing, yeah. isn't it? Uh, this past weekend, I was just up in uh, just up in Bishop, uh, Bishop, California, for some caught a couple of nice trout. You know, I, I love fishing. I usually, it's just nice. When I'm on the road in the states, I usually take a small rig with a couple of portable rods on the road with me. Oh really? But how, do you get, uh, how do you get? How do you get to the local lake? Well, usually there's something, there's some either a lake or a river or something, or sometimes you're near the ocean. Right. And you, just, you know, go over there. If there's something close, I'll, I'll go over and throw my line down. It doesn't matter what it is or where it is. That's cool, man. Yeah, fishing yeah. is totally relaxing. I love it. Uh, yeah, my buddy, uh, great drummer Jimmy Paxson got me into fishing on the road. That's cool. And now, now I'm definitely into it. That and a little racquetball and, you know. <laughs> Not handball. Uh, they don't have handball out here, man. I tried to. I actually, when I first came out here, I found a handball club in the San Fernando Valley, but it wasn't the same as being in New York. You know, I was used to like a one wall thing. You know, yeah. they was four walls. I was like, oh, all right, you know. Those guys are super competitive here in the back. Yeah, the, those like guys that. are that, like. That, that bums me out. It takes the fun out of it. And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I'll just walk. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like macho and shit like that, you yeah. know? Yeah. They're, but I think there were a couple of schools that had single wall, uh, single these single walls that you could play handball. In. And I would get a couple of New York guys and say, you know, we'd get the little racquetball and use that, the blue right. ball, and use that. Because you couldn't find a Spalding anywhere. Right. I don't know if they make those <laughs> I don't pieces. know if they sell them anymore, man. You know, all that. <laughs> You know, there's so much old stuff from New York. You know, the pinky balls, the the stick ball sticks. Right, you know, right. which was a broomstick. Right. Um, tops. Sk- Skelly. Tops. Yeah, with the Sticks. bottle caps. And we used to yeah. smash the. We used to get the real good ones. Were off the bottom of the the chair in school. The little metal ones. The metal ones. Yeah, right. Those right, are nice right. and smooth, and you fill them with wax. Like I used to love playing tops. It's so yeah. funny, man. I still remember all those childhood games, Stoop Ball, right. and Johnny and the Pony, <laughs> you know, all these crazy fucking games we used to play. You know. Hey, what's your Never favorite? Never like a childhood. No, no, man. It's especially the fun stuff like that. Yeah. Favorite place you've traveled? Japan. That's going to be my home one of these days. Really? One of, yeah, I, I love Japan very much. One of these days, I'm not going to use my return ticket. Good for you. That's that's always in the top. You know, Japan, Spain uh, is another one, and Australia Spain, typically come out yeah. of the top. It's nothing wrong with either one of those. Yeah. Believe, me. been to all of them, and they're amazing. But my my heart is in Japan. You are yeah, Japanese, no. you said, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah very yeah. cool. But I, I've always even before I met her, I was I was in love with Japan. The first first time I set foot on it in in the seventies with Melissa, it was three hundred and fifty yen to the dollar. Holy smokes. Those were the old days, buddy. Wow. hundred bucks took you everywhere. <laughs> it, was, it, was really, it was great. But I've uh, since that time, I've always had a love affair with the culture and the food and the people. It's just the I food love it. is delicious, man. I love the food. Ah, please. I miss it so much. 
<laughs> hey, two two more questions, Lenny. Uh, sure. Most most important lesson your business has taught you? Keep an eye on everything and everybody. That's cool, man. And I'm not going to get into details. No, just, no, 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 no. Hey, man, it's, you pay, every, what I'm talking about. everybody pays tuition. You know, that's when you own a business, you pay tuition. That's just the reality. You know, the funny thing is, I am my business. Yes, you, know? you are right, hundred yeah. percent. Exactly. Exactly. It's funny. I interviewed um Dave Mason, you know, from Traffic oh. a long yeah. time ago, and he's. I asked him that question, and his response was really weird. He goes, "Don't trust anyone." <laughs> and I was like, that's a little on the dark side. Fuck, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I kind of know where that's coming from because I know a lot of people yeah. who have been ripped off by managers and accountants, but right. for not for pennies. Thousands oh, yeah. of yeah. dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go into litigation with these guys, and that's another chunk you yeah. got to get to the lawyers. Right, right. You know, yeah. you got to be careful. And I I feel for my brother's, you know, his that what he said is definitely true. <laughs> but not to that point. Yeah, he was a little dark. I was like, you know, I got a lot of guys and a lot of friends that I really trust. You know, yeah. I, I trust most of the people in my. Business. No, but you got to keep your eye on the shit for sure, man. But it's you know, managers and agents and record company people. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be friendly with y'all. Good for you, man. <laughs> and last question, man. Biggest change in your personality over the last ten years, and how much of that has been intentional, and how much is just a part of aging? Ooh. Any changes? Well, uh, I'm not in a hurry anymore. That you know, cool. I take a little bit, you know, I'm not rushing anywhere, you know. And uh, I just like to take my time with my writing and with my music. And um, But to tell you, basically, I haven't changed that much with all the things that I've been through, you know. Emotionally and stuff like that, I pretty much kept my personality up and kept it the same. But like I said, you know, the older you get, you know, you just go, okay, I'm not rushing anywhere. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm taking it easy. I understand more about groove now than I ever did. Uh, the placement of groove, what is a groove, how to accomplish a good groove, those things. Now, you know, I'm picking and choosing my spots. Uh, I'm not rushing anywhere to do you know what I need, uh, not what I need to do, and enjoying life a lot more. Dude, enjoying lot thank more. you so much, man, for everything. It's, I really appreciate it, man. You yeah. honestly, you're like one of the greatest vibes I've. You, you, you got to, you're. <laughs> I mean, you just like you know everybody pay this man if you want your fucking records to be better. Even if you don't let him play, just let him get in your room. Seriously, man, you're like contagious just man let, let my energy permeate your free <laughs> yeah lenny has a, a special you could buy chi energy on his website <laughs> oh, God, if, I could, if i could bottle that and, and sell it forget about it uh, hey, thank you man you, you got a new friend here man anything you, that bro. i can do for you man it's been a real pleasure likewise You've been very comfortable and i feel like i've known you forever <laughs> thank you likewise you're such an easy guy to talk to though man come on let well, me tell I people i want to tell people where to, about your record i want people to listen so here's where i want you to do everybody check out hands of silk and stone is by lenny castro's latest first it's his first solo record the second will be coming out mm -hmm. 2020 2019 maybe before yeah i'm awesome. working on it now. i don't you know i don't like to wait too long dude don't let grass grow Hands of Silk and Stone. It's a great freaking record. Um, really cool. Really nice record. It's not um, a drum record. It's got great songs on it with great grooves, you know. And uh, if you want to get a hold of Lenny and you're interested in having him work on your tracks or doing some, you know, soundtracks for you or playing on one of your records, go to his website and contact him. His website is Hard Hands. H a r d h a n d s. And he's got a hard hands but a soft heart. That'll tell you, man. And uh, you can uh, go. He's got a contact form in there. So if you're looking to work with Lenny, go on there and email him. He's going to be out with Toto. Toto's going to be in Europe through the summertime. They come back to the States in September, and they will start touring September. And that'll be it for a while, Luke said, correct? Yeah, that'll be it for the rest of the year. When, and I think the, the powers that be are trying to reinvent the situation for next year. I'm sure... Lucather has got some plans. He's he's always 
I tell you, that that man is just <laughs> he works overtime. I love him to death. And he said, as long as we're still running and still alive, we're going to be working. That's awesome. So go check out Toto and uh, see him on the road and, and uh, say hi to Lenny. Um, bro, any final words of wisdom? Oh, my goodness. Keep supporting real music, people. Yes. Keep supporting real music. That's yeah. great, man. I agree. Everybody, uh, thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it on your social media channels. Thanks so much to Lenny Castro. We appreciate his time. Please go check out his music, Hands of Silk and Stone. And this is a guy with Hands of Silk and Stone for sure. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar or your drums or your congas. Or your cajon. <laughs> or your cajon, that's right. And have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Peace.